Okay. So hello and welcome everyone to episode 10, our final episode of season three. I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series and Digging In is a series of live presentations with scholars from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We are going to begin today with a land acknowledgement for the land that the Peabody Institute and its school Phillips Academy are on. Phillips Academy occupies the land of the Penacook and Patuxet people and the lands of the contemporary Abenaki, Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Wabanaki, Poconoke, and Nipmunk nations. We honor all indigenous peoples who are here now, have been here um, from time immemorial and will be here in the future. And we acknowledge indigenous genocide and the continued oppression of native peoples, voices, cultures, and spiritualities. We understand how education has been used by settler institutions in the attempted erasure of indigenous peoples, and we commit to interrogating the histories of and our complicity in colonization, centering native voices and communities, and dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism at Phillips Academy and beyond. Um, and so join us uh, in 2022 next year uh, when season four begins on January 26th. And if you enjoy our programming, consider expanding your impact by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We're able to bring you outstanding programming through the support of viewers like you. And today we are very excited to welcome Dr. April Bisa. April Bisa is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at Vassar College in New York's Hudson River Valley. There she teaches courses on North American archaeology, heritage, museums, and forensics. Dr. Bisa believes that the archaeology of the recent past and of the places where we live and work can be a powerful tool for critiquing the present and imagining better futures. She just finished writing a book on how the New York City water system removed thousands of people from homes and communities up to 125 miles away from the city. And many who drink New York City's water have no idea that this happened. Um, now, Dr. Bisa is working on a new book, An Archaeology of American Protest, with fellow archaeologist Dania Jordan, who's also a UMass Boston and a friend of mine, a uh, graduate. Um, so during and at the conclusion of the talk, viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the Q&A fact function or the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then we will give our speaker time to answer as many questions as they can with the understanding they might not get to all of them. So welcome Dr. Bison. thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So turn it over to you, you can start sharing, you can do whatever you want. All right, well, whatever I want, that's a whole different thing right there. So let me get the sharing going on and does that look great for everybody? All right. So I'm going to talk to you about the archaeology of American protests um, as Denis and I are envisioning it, um, focusing on documenting the places and things of communal action more than actually like excavating sites. So this is more of a contemporary archaeology, but we're going to be talking about um, the excavations that other people have done um, at sites in general. And the main framing for this project is um, that the ability to protest to change America to make America better is part of America's origin story. So the Boston Tea Party, uh, this is a United States stamp series here in the image. Um, we are told when we learn American history that the Boston Tea Party rallied Americans to fight for independence before they were actually really Americans. Um, so the Boston Tea Party occurred uh, December 16th, 1773, when 342 chests of tea were dumped into the Boston Harbor by white men dressed as Indians. We usually skip over that point a little bit, um, but here's a close up of the same stamp. And I want to kind of push back about how effective is protesting? Is it that if you protest, you will get what you need from that protest? Or even will the message be heard? Um, so what happened after the Boston Tea Party? Well, the British government closed the harbor until compensation would be paid. And Benjamin Franklin, one of the most Americans of all Americans, said, yeah, they should be compensated for their lost tea. And he offered to pay himself. 
In general, the Massachusetts colony lost many freedoms after their protest. And there was a second Boston Tea Party about six months later and other Tea Party events throughout the colonies um, to show support and solidarity. So our origin story about protesting versus the reality of what it's like to protest in America is something that we want to poke at a bit. Um, protesting is in the Constitution, or is it? Um, in the First Amendment, it says that people have the right to peaceably assemble and petition government for a redress of grievances. So a lot of protests get labeled non-peaceable, and therefore they are not allowed to happen, which is why you see law enforcement involved in a lot of protests and protesters getting arrested constantly. So there is the right to peaceably protest, but the definition of that is very variable. The Supreme Court has said that the government may regulate the time and place and other uh, details of when a protest actually occurs, and that the government has a right to require a permit in a head for protesting. So we don't even have as many rights to protest, I think, as many people think that Americans have. And this leads to our protests looking like things like this, where you have militarized police, you know, in this picture, more populous than anybody else. Uh, make sure you pay attention to the helicopter there. So there's the, the right to protest versus the reality of what it's like to protest as an American to create a different America. And a major example of this that I found very compelling was the Standing Rock protest against the Dakota Access Pipeline that started in April of 2016 and went until February of 2017. I think Americans have this expectation that we're oversold that freedom to protest and the freedoms that come from protests are things that happen pretty quickly, pretty easily. You protest, you get heard, something changes. This is a headline from an article from the Washington Post from 2017, where the headline says the civil rights in Vietnam protests changed America. Today, they might be illegal. And the picture there has some protesters wearing suits and holding a sign that says, end the war in Vietnam. Well, the first Vietnam protest or anti-Vietnam war protest in America was in 1967, or at least ones that got enough attention to be documented. But the US final withdrawal wasn't until 1975. The war was quote unquote over in 1973. So there are years between protesting and any action that then happens. The Standing Rock protests from 2016 to 2017, the pipeline was then built, right? So it's not that protests necessarily lead to the outcome that the protesters are protesting for. So in 1955, Rosa Parks begins the civil rights protest that we know of from the, the um, seating in the bus. But it wasn't until 1964 that the Civil Rights Act passed and we're still having civil rights issues today. So did protests, are those the things that actually change America? Or are those just the tip of the iceberg that we'll get to in a minute? So what is archaeology's role in all of this? I think that as archaeologists, we're unique that we focus on time in a longevity, this happened, that happened, that happened thing, in ways that other fields don't. They don't focus on hundreds of years like we do. So we could look at the longevity of struggles. We could draw connections between times, places, and actions with our focus on landscapes and sites, and then the things that are created and left behind there. We could frame protests as part of longer term activism. We could also lend expertise to activists who seek it. And we could try to do work that does good. So my one of my inspirations for turning my attention towards this is the work of archaeologist Dr. Cheryl LaRoche, who was involved in many uh, protest related archaeology projects in New York and in Pennsylvania. And this is an article that she wrote um, where the picture has her talking from the viewing platform of excavations in Philadelphia at Independence Hall. Um, what was going on there was that the um, US government's National Park Service was creating a new uh, Independence Mall feature there. And they were going to be building on what was the site of George Washington's presidential mansion 
when he got moved from New York City to um, Philadelphia when Philadelphia was the temporary capital of the United States. And as part of George Washington's removal to Philadelphia to establish the presidential mansion there, he had asked for a smokehouse to be refitted so that it would actually home some or all of the nine enslaved Africans that he was bringing with him. So American history does not tell us that George Washington had enslaved people at the presidential mansion, right? They don't tell us their stories. So it was local activists in Philadelphia who started protesting and pushed the National Park Service to do archeology, span to try to find whatever can be found out about the realities of the lives of those enslaved people there. So Cheryl was part of that and talking on that platform there. But she was also involved with the African burial ground um, discovered in uh, Manhattan in 1991 and in the lesser known 227 Duffield Street in Brooklyn, New York. In 2004, uh, local community activists got to Cheryl through the Society for Historical Archaeology seeking help for saving a house that was linked to the Underground Railroad and to prominent abolitionists. And they were seeking archeologists help to save the building that was going to be demolished by eminent domain. So just in February, 2021 was this uh, press conference where one of the activists is announcing that the building was saved. It's now a New York City landmark, um, but it took from them reaching out to her in 2004, and I'm sure their efforts started earlier than they reached out to her, all the way till 2021 before that building was saved. Um, and it's written about in this article that Cheryl wrote, Archaeology, the Activist Community, and the Redistribution of Power in New York City um, in 2011. So these people are behind the activists are holding signs that link 227 Duffield to Black Lives Matter. And they're holding signs that say Black history matters, Black landmarks matter, preserve Black history. So again, there's this kind of chain between um, these activist uh, movements. But the goal for 227 Duffield is that it's going to be known as 227 Abolitionist Place. Um, and it's going to become a museum about um, abolition and, and uh, Underground Railroad. So two quotes from Cheryl's 2011 article that I uh, feed off of and draw off of is she said that important African American historical and archaeological sites frequently emerge only after lengthy public protest. So it's that protests are what's causing the archaeology to happen, right? So that's one way of looking at archaeology and protests. She also said that in her work with activists that archaeology feeds the hunger for a usable past which is something that I think really frames archaeology in a different way than it's normally framed. So where she's doing archaeology with activists and therefore it's part of activism, I started thinking more about the archaeology of activism. And can we contextualize and connect protests to the larger struggles that many Americans believe are over because they stop hearing about it in the news? And we could use our archeological sensibilities to critique the layers of what remains, right? So Independence Hall's National Park is on top of slave quarters, right? And that, that's powerful and archeological at the same time. We can find places and things that unlock these sorts of stories that also tell about the toll that protesting takes on activists. Why you don't see what's happening after the protest camps got closed down at Standing Rock, it was still, there were still protests, but it wasn't making the news. You also can see more of that, those underlying social movements that continue to get better sense of how protesting doesn't lead to immediate change. So who doesn't like an iceberg meme? Uh, so the protests that you see in the national media are just a little bit of you know what the, all the protests that go uncovered, which are just a little bit of what all the dedicated activists are trying to do, which are in response to social movements, which are in response to some injustice. And ideally, we want to get to all of that to understand what it's like to protest in America and how America really does change or doesn't change. So my worked with the, the Standing Rock uh, protest wasn't, I didn't go there and I didn't excavate there and I didn't take artifacts away from them. 
what I was doing was looking at um, all of these layers of information that was created through media. And I'm on Twitter and the no DAPL or no Dakota Access Pipeline hashtag was trending for a long time. And then people started this yes DAPL or yes Dakota Access Pipeline hashtag. And it was very fascinating to see the ignorance behind a lot of what they were depicting. So I'm just gonna share two quickly with you here. Um, remember, you're only allowed to peaceably protest. So here, uh, Tammy tweets a picture um, saying, oh yes, another peaceful protest, pretty much trying to say these should be shut down because they're violent. Because a protester somewhere, this doesn't look like it's actually at Standing Rock, is holding the sign that says, kill the pilgrim, save the water. So this isn't really to incite violence of murder nowadays. Um, it's hard to find these pilgrims to kill them anyway. Um, it was really hearkening back to kill the Indian, save the man, which was the government policy of the United States in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. So this is like sarcasm here, um, but you have to understand that history. Another tweet that uh, I thought was showing the problem, but also how archaeology could help is this both the image says there's a map and at the bottom it says it does not make sense, does it? And then the person tweeting it also says it doesn't make sense. So they're really trying to reinforce that these protests are nonsensical. And the map shows that the pipeline in red is outside of the Standing Rock Reservation. So they don't even have any reason to protest really, but that it also crossed water elsewhere. And why weren't they upset about that? But this is a map that um, geographer Carl Sack created, and he um, changed it a little bit so that I could use it in my uh, article that I published about this. Um, that here, the pipeline is the solid black line. Um, and if you look at the red arrow, and I tried using glitter ink on uh, PowerPoint to try to highlight it, and then I also highlighted it, that the, the this pipeline crosses a large amount of unceded Sioux territory under the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie. So it's not just that, oh, it's it, why it's outside of the reservation boundary. The reservation boundary itself is something that should be up for discussion. And the archaeology was focused on the little part of the, the pipeline, you know, where we could find the physical remains of ancient Sioux ways of life. When we have a historic document saying that this is Sioux's land, right, that the government acknowledged that I think there should have been much more of a, of a focus on the living indigenous people and not focus um, purely on the archaeology site. But getting back to the treaty, um, this is from the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie because the government changed the treaty boundaries without permission from the people uh, that are the other side of the treaty. So that's why it's called unceded, um, where it says the United States hereby agrees and stipulates that the country, this area, shall be head and held and considered to be unceded Indian territory and also stipulates and agrees that no white person or persons shall be permitted to settle upon or occupy any portion of the same or without consent of the Indians first hadn't obtained to pass through the same. So according to the Treaty of Fort Laramie, we shouldn't have been allowed to put the pipeline there if the Sioux did not want the pipeline there, right? Through this government legal document. So all of that comes together to say that the Standing Rock protests to, to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline made sense. It makes sense within the contents of uh, past and present struggles for indigenous rights and sovereignty, but it also makes sense if you connect it to other protests related to those issues that you see this longevity, that Standing Rock is not this isolated thing. And one of the easiest ways to show Americans this is to talk about Alcatraz's 150 year history as a site of indigenous resistance and protest. So Alcatraz Island is this federal penitentiary on this rock of land that is in the San Francisco Bay. It gets 1.4 million visitors a year, which is a lot of people that potentially could be educated about indigenous rights. Although many people go there to learn about the federal penitentiary that was there for just 30 years and to see this cell block, 
it really has this long history of indigenous people being imprisoned there and still continuing to today on Thanksgiving Day, I was watching the live stream of this. Um, every year is the annual sunrise ceremony or an unThanksgiving event that recalls the indigenous oppression and speaks to what should be done today, but also celebrates indigenous culture, um, not just in the United States. So this picture is a picture of the Hopi men that were imprisoned on Alcatraz when it was a fort before it was a penitentiary, and they were imprisoned there in 1895. In 1884, an Apache chief was imprisoned and died there, and that's going to come back again, going to be important in a minute. After the penitentiary closed, the US government was asking, what should we do with this island? And in 1964, a group of Sioux, Sioux is a theme here, um, occupied Alcatraz and said, we'll take it. Um, in 1969, a group of indigenous people known as the Indians of all tribes, that's what they called themselves, came to the island and they stayed until 1971 and occupied it. So I'm going to read the words to you today or some of the words um, spoken by the Indian of all tribes when they came in 1969. So this was a, a press release. We have gone to Alcatraz Island to preserve our dignity and beauty and to assert our position. The people of this country know a little of the real story and tragedy of the Indian people today. We intend to tell them that story. This is only the first stepping stone of a great ladder of Indian progress. We appeal to your sense of fair play and your desire to do what is right by all peoples. Indian people appeal to you to stand up and help us in our time of need. So they left in 1971. I went to Alcatraz in 2015 to take a tour because I had heard that the National Park Service was restoring some of the graffiti from the protesters and doing more interpretation of the actual protest than they had ever done before. I was told to meet the park ranger under this sign to prepare for being told what there was to do on the island that day. And when I looked up, I saw this sign where they had restored some of the protest graffiti, but not all of it. So when you first get off the boat and you look up, it says Indians welcome United States Penitentiary. So for people who don't understand the protest and what happened there, that is very confusing. This is what the full graffiti looked like if you had arrived during the protest in 1969. Indians welcome United Indian property, Indian land. Right? It's a very different message. And this message, I think, led to confusion that after you leave that spot, you start walking up the hill towards this fire tower. And the fire tower has some graffiti that says, peace and freedom, home of the free. But I was listening to other tourists and they were saying things like, why didn't the Park Service paint over that? instead of understanding that the Park Service was helping to restore it, and the people restoring it are veterans and their descendants of the occupation. One woman thought that it was a prisoner revolt, that the indigenous prisoners had broken out of their cells and defaced government property, and therefore this should be painted over. And I think it's because when you first see Indians welcome United States Penitentiary and you don't know anything else, well, of course that's what you're going to believe. When you leave the cell block, if you go out the door, turn around and look up, there's this, what could be a subtle uh, thing that you miss, an American Eagle flag and shield, but the Eagle is also a native symbol, not just an American symbol. The um, protesters had painted the word free into the flag very subtly there. But in the archives from the protest, you could see that the protesters actually had put up a cardboard sign that said, this land is my land, and taped to it a picture of Goathele or Geronimo, an Apache resistance leader who had died 60 years earlier. Remember, there was an Apache chief who had died on the island, a different person than this. So again, there's these connections where the protesters themselves are making the connections to other protests. So people who are not part of the protest need to make these connections in order to understand what the protest is actually protesting for. One of the artifacts that's in curation is this um, 
ball that is from the island, from the protesters, where somebody wrote me, the power of peaceful freedom. I think if protesters saw things like this as being depicted as what their experience was, then the people who aren't protesting might think of them differently instead of thinking of protesters as violent and asking for things that they shouldn't have, seeing these protesters as people fighting for peaceful freedom. So the last thing about Alcatraz that I wanna tell you is that people brought their children there and they lived there with their children. And one of the things that they did was establish a school, the Big Rock School during the protest. So this again shows that this isn't a violent act. This was trying to, to make a political movement to try to live a better life. Um, and Peter Blue Cloud, uh, a Mohawk, who was one of the, the spokespeople of the, the protest, said these children were what the occupation was all about. It was for their future that we dared to defy the government. So this picture, as you can kind of see that welcome sign in the upper left, uh, Richard Oakes, who spoke the words I said earlier in the presentation, who was a leader of the protest, um, he had his daughter Yvonne on the island, who's giving you the peace symbol. Uh, unfortunately, Yvonne fell to her death on the island as an accident, um, and Richard lost his motivation and he left the island after that happened. So this is really about people wanting to live better lives. It's not a violent protest. So linking that back to Standing Rock, as if I need to link it back again, because there's so many linkages, this was one of the headlines from a native uh, news outlet, Indian Z, saying that school starts at the No Dapple camp as pipeline resistance digs in for the long haul. So Standing Rock had schools, Alcatraz had schools. What would it, the protests have been like? Would there have been lots of yes dapple hashtags if these were the kinds of images that people saw of the protesters instead of images of militarized police trying to force protesters to stop? And uh, I worked with my department administrative assistant today to identify that toy that is a twinkle sparkle of the My Little Pony, uh, right? This is a child with a, with a toy and a, and a mother. Th these are who the protesters are. And I, I suspect that they would also say that they're doing it for the children. So to wrap up, I think the archaeology of activism can contextualize and connect protests to larger struggles that Americans may believe are over by critiquing layers of what remains and finding places and things that unlock stories of the toll that protesting takes on activists and the underlying social movements that continue. So the book that Dania and I are working on, uh, The Archaeology of American Protests, will explore America's relationships with protests and protesters through struggles for self-governance, especially through Indian nations, for equality, we're going to include African-American and anti-patriarchy protests, and for prosperity, for socioeconomic issues, for labor issues, and for environmental issues. That's what I got. Perfect. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, so yeah, so people can send in their questions uh, via the chat or the Q&A function. Um, we've already had a few comments such as the Fort Point staff at the tip of San Francisco are also doing some work on these topics for their visitors. Um, Natalie says, read the book, There, There by Tommy Orange, which is a really good one. Some of our, at Phillips Academy, some of our English um, classes actually uh, have students read There, There. Um, what was the most surprising thing that you learned while doing this research? That's a question. Yeah, I, I keep finding more and more linkages. And this is in a lot of the, um, literature on social movements in general, that there are people whose identity is to be an activist and they move from issue to issue, but they're, it's not moving from issue to issue and in, in that they're kind of like flaky and, and just wanna be a radical, but that in so many issues actually link to the same underlying thing that they care about, right? So like, if you are protesting against the Vietnam War, are you an anti-war protest? Are you a women's rights protester, right? All of these things, are you an environmental protester, right? War impacts all of these things. 
So there's so many connections that even somebody who's interested in these connections didn't necessarily see um, before just starting to scratch that surface. Okay, we have another question is um, about how many of these sort of forgotten protests um, and locations have you looked at? We're starting with um, finding where archaeologists have done work. So as we find that an archaeologist has done work on something, then we're uncovering it that way. For the article that I published on Alcatraz and Standing Rock, um, my research assistant, who was a Vassar student, um, looked at hundreds of uh, Native American indigenous protests and looked for any protest that mentioned Alcatraz. And we created a pushpin Google map. And I think there were something like 70 protests on that map that said that they were inspired by Alcatraz. So that's a lot. And there, there's so many of these um, pipeline protests that are going on today that some of my students have done projects on, so I've learned more about them. So I would say I couldn't even like total how many there are. Um, there, there's so many protests past, present that are going on and, and have gone on, but um, I would say that I, I was the most uh, not knowledgeable about the LGBTQ protests history that um, starting with the Stonewall in, in, in New York City and working backwards from that have been finding a lot. And we're running into when is something just resistance and when is something a protest? So for um, African-American and, and gay communities establishing enclaves, right? We're not labeling that as protest we're labeling that as resistance and you know partially because the book has to end at some point but we're seeing protests as when you're trying to get public attention and attention of the people who have the power to change something <coughs> versus you know me existing is protest i'm not saying that that's not legitimate but we would never everything would be a protest at that point um, sort of going along with that, are you guys going to be looking at sort of any protests related to like the farm workers and um, sort of that area, you know, history of like California and stuff? So the, the things we have right now is um, that are our primary focus and things are unraveling as we're doing our research is that in the fight for self-governance, we're focusing on the Pueblo revolt. Um, the Ghost Dance, which Ghost Dance was very big at Standing Rock, um, Red Power in general, but primarily through Alcatraz, um, for the fight for equality for African American sites, we're looking at abolitionist and underground railroad sites, um, especially Beacon Hill that Dania has lots of um, knowledge and expertise on. For civil rights, we're looking at the Brown versus Board of Ed um, school that is um, under the National Park Service. Also the Tulsa race massacre, um, that great work is being done out there. Um, and Black Lives Matter being curated at the National Museum of the African American Heritage now, that, that new museum and their new way of curating things where they're being criticized for curating things as they're happening. For anti-patriarchy, we're looking at suffragist sites and sites of reformers in general. I've just been dealing with utopian communities this past weekend, um, but we're also looking at bodies under anti-patriotic patriarchy. So we're we're trying to find the abortion, the Me Too, uh, the missing, murdered Indigenous women sites, um, and then the Stonewall uprising I had already mentioned. For prosperity, we're primarily looking at um, Bacon's Rebellion, which can be seen as a middle-class rebellion. Um, the Ludlow Colorado Coalfield War um, Occupy uh, protests that uh, lots of archeology span has been done on. Then the Occupy, Occupy Wall Street protests. Um, and then for environmental protests, we're looking at uh, nuclear disarmament, specifically the Nevada peace camps. Um, the water protectors, such as at Standing Rock, and getting a little into climate marches and how um, climate marches seem to be something that archaeologists aren't paying attention to. I, I, all the archaeology about 
uh, climate related issues is very focused on that archaeologists have to remain objective scientists, which is very different from the archaeology of all of these other things. Right, so we're going to kind of peel at that, there, that there isn't a lot of archaeology going on about environmental issues, other than we need to document how the planet is changing, um, instead of thinking about, you know, the things that people are asking for. Very cool. And I just have to say as a little plug for everyone, uh, but also I don't know if April knows this. So um, in terms of the Pueblo Revolt, um, on the Peabody blog, I have posted a thing about a new lesson I created about the Pueblo Revolt using um, uh, Jason Garcia's artwork. He's a modern uh, Tiwa artist, um, but he does it in a um, sort of comic book style and everything, because there's no modern, you know, contemporary, you know, to the Spanish account, right? But that doesn't mean there aren't, it's just oral traditions, right? Like, so it's kind of pulling that layer for the students. So definitely look at Jason Garcia's artwork, everyone, but also check out the Peabody blog for the new lesson that we offer. Um, the last question that we have is your pushpin Google map. Is this something people can access or is this just like an internal thing? Uh, no, we, we actually tried to crowdsource it and we didn't get much feedback on from the crowdsourcing, like two people responded. Um, so it is, it is out there. The image of it is in um, the article that I wrote. Um, that is in the, the journal Historical Archaeology. But if anybody emails me um, and you just find me through Vassar, um, I will send it to you, the link, and you could add to it yourself. You could comment on it. It's, it's completely open source. OK, perfect. Well, those were the questions that everyone had for you. Thank you, April. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Again, we look forward to seeing you join us in the new years. Have a good holiday season, everyone sort of, you know, quiet, you know, quiet down and everything. Oh, one more question just popped in. Um, can you recommend resources or give info about the Taino destruction by Columbus's son when governor of Santo Domingo? Um, That's not anything that I have the expertise on. I'm yeah. happy to, to research it and see if we can include it in the book, but you know, I, I don't want to go beyond my expertise. Uh, Avi says no worries. Um, right. But yeah, so thank you everyone. Again, uh, consider becoming members of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society and we will see you next year. Bye, Goodbye. thank you. Bye.